Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 2009 film The Collector, and when I'm doing this review, I had watched it on the Shutter streaming service, so I think it should still be available there when I'm putting this up. Now, uh, obviously this film came out during the whole torture porn phase of uh, horror films, which, if you think about it, it really didn't last all that long. I mean, the, the main torture porn films that people still point at nowadays are, you know, The Collector, the follow-up, the collection, uh, all the Saw films, which is the the one that people mostly point to, and then the Hostel films, and then there are a few lesser ones where you know I guess the the French extremity films uh, kind of fit into that area, and you know all those things. But uh, it was relatively short-lived, though. It really wasn't that many films that ended up in the torture porn segment. But uh, yeah, it was a flash in the pan, basically. But uh, the Collector, directed by Marcus Dunstan, who also directed The Collection, which was the follow-up. The Neighbor, hooked up, and will be directing, apparently, The Collected, which is supposed to be a third installment of this, I guess, will become a trilogy. Now, I was looking up information on it, and I, and I found somewhere where it said it was supposed to be released in 2020, but then I can't find anything about it being released in 2020, and, uh, yeah, we're basically almost done with it, so... I don't know what's actually going to happen with that. I am interested to see where they go with it, because um, I think it's a compelling enough story at its core. Uh, written by Dunstan as well and his writing partner, Patrick Melton. They've written a lot of scripts together. They did the scripts for Feast. Feast 2, Sloppy Seconds. Feast 3, The Happy Finish. Which, by the way, if people don't know, Feast came about because of the um, Project Greenlight. And uh, John Gulliger was the director of those. And I think it was mainly based off of their script that uh, they won Project Greenlight, and then they were able to get Gulliger to make the film, and then they got two sequels out of that, which was pretty impressive. Uh, I'll review those at some point. Uh, they also did the scripts for Saw 4, IV, Saw 5, and Saw 6. Uh, also Saw the final chapter, which is the seventh one as well. Now, I will say, uh, at some point I will review the Saw films, Overall, I enjoyed the Saw films. I thought 5 was awful. 5, I think, was probably the worst of all of them. 6 kind of rebounded a little bit, a little bit after 5, and then 7 was meh. But I think all the way up through 4, pretty solid. And I thought some of the some of the things that they did in 4 with that script was actually not bad. Uh, they've also written scripts for Piranha 3 Double D, The Collection, The Collected, and The Neighbor, just so you know. So the collector had a $3 million budget and it made $9.44 million, so not bad. You know, for a relatively small film, they did fine. It was originally called The Midnight Man, which honestly, I think the collector is better. It's a much, much better title. And The Midnight Man was chosen by Dunstan Melton. Uh, apparently, the production company are the ones that said, let's, you know, not do The Midnight Man. Let's do something else. Uh, it was originally pitched as a Saw franchise prequel. Now, that is an inter interesting thing to know watching the film, and I knew that going into the film. So watching it, I was like, I can see where they could have made this a prequel thing, where maybe uh, the killer would have been either a John Kramer when he's just getting things started, or the killer could have been um, you know, someone who inspired John Kramer. I don't know. I don't know what their, what their thought in tying it into the Saw franchise really was. Obviously, they had to kind of change some things in the script after it was decided we don't want to do the prequel thing. So, so you know. But it's interesting to know and watch it knowing that it was meant to be a prequel to Saw. So you can see a lot of the Saw influence in the film. And I would argue that you don't just see the Saw influence in the film because of, like, the traps, which is the most obvious thing, and kind of just the overall story idea, but the directing style. I believe this was the first film that Dunstan actually directed, and you can see where he probably took a lot from the Saw films and kind of incorporated it into his style of directing. Which, gotta be honest, in this film, the directing's a little bit rough. Uh, one of the big things that kind of, <laughs> kind of uh, jumps out at me is a lot of rough cuts in the film, especially early on in the film, uh, where it's like you go from one cut to another cut, and it seems so abrupt. It uh, also, in, in addition to that, is the issue that 
it's mainly just early on in the film. It kind of settles down as it goes on further. But when there are more characters in the film early on and they're introducing a bunch of people, they do a lot of those rough cuts and they have the takes, those cuts, like starting with a person coming at the camera. Like, go back and watch the beginning of this film and just take note of how many times it cuts to something and it's someone coming at the camera. It's like repeatedly, you really notice it and it's really annoying and, and not very good directing, honestly. So I think Dunstan got better after this film, but a little bit rough. There was an alternate ending to this film, which was basically, I mean, it's actually in the film. They just would have had less of the film. Basically, in the end of the, of the originally... It was going to be the Arkin gets outside, he looks back, and he sees Hannah in the window trapped. And then they were just going to end it there. Which, I would have been fine with that. But I think that the way they chose to add on to it and end it ended up being maybe a little bit better. Alright, so the opening shot of this film has a bunch of insects inside of a streetlight, if you notice. And I think that's kind of a clue early on in the film to who the collector will actually end up being because at the end we obviously see that the collector was in the exterminator crew uh and i think if you go back to the beginning when um when arkin's there working on the house initially and he goes and tells the exterminator crew that there's that wasp nest near i think it's a greenhouse um the guy with the mask on at the time like the respirator mask i think that's him the guy who plays the collector so if you go back and look, that's, I think that's the dude. So uh, I just like how they opened with that, though, with, you know, the lamp light with all the insects in there. It's that clue, like, the collector is going to be an exterminator. The beginning portion with the box in the house is actually a really great attention grabber. Now, I will say I don't understand this concept of the person in the box being the bait. Like, it seems like the collector does fine just, you know, trapping people or killing people or whatever so the idea of the person in the box being bait doesn't actually work really it's kind of a what do you mean type thing but i will say how they use the box in the beginning of the film really is a great attention grabber it makes you want to know more about this killer it makes you want to know where this film is going and it just gives you just enough to really pull you in so i do like that they start it that way but like i said i just i don't think this whole using people as bait thing is really interesting or I, it it doesn't make sense it really does not make sense especially when you see all the events that happen at the house of those rich people that's just what i'm gonna call them i don't remember all their names the opening credits music is not so hot um it, it did not age well maybe it was good for 2009 but it did not age well it's not very good it's actually really annoying and goes on way too long in my opinion not a fan of that uh, I think the hornet's nest that Arkin ends up coming across is, is kind of a foreshadowing of him kind of later walking into a hornet's nest because he really does with all of the traps and the collector already inside that house. Uh, they use Arkin's daughter a, uh, to create in instant sympathy in this film. I'm sure a lot of people kind of get that. That's something that I don't like in film. I think that's a very lazy way to make people feel for a character. Uh, it's been used so much over time in scripts, and I don't like it. I think it's lazy writing, and um, I think it's dumb. I think it's a dumb way to exploit it. If it makes more sense, if you develop the character even more and you really develop their relationship with their family or their life situation, it's a little bit different. But with this, it kind of just jumps into it. It doesn't really explain Arkin a whole lot. It doesn't explain his life situation a whole lot. It doesn't show his relationship with his kid or his ex-wife or ex-girlfriend or whoever it is a whole lot. Um, it's very on the surface. There's not a whole lot of depth to the film. It really mainly is about the torture porn and just about that main overall idea of this collector, which I like the idea of this character of the collector, and he looks great. Um, but, yeah, the whole using a kid to kind of make people like, oh, he's got a kid. I mean, it... it it comes into play with making him, you know, more drawn to trying to save Hannah. But I think that you don't need him to have a kid in order for that to happen. I think most people are drawn to, ah, it's a kid. I should help them out in this situation. You know, I don't have any kids. But if I saw a kid in a bad situation, I would want to help them. Definitely. So, just saying. This is one of my pet peeves. I know a lot of people out there will watch this and be like, ah, oh, it doesn't bother me at all. And that's fine. It's just my opinion. 
The dog almost getting Arkin shows that he's not actually prepared for the job that he's about to do when he's going to break into the house. But then later, it's interesting because they add the twist of you finding out that it wasn't a situation where it was just, oh, he forgot that they had a dog or he didn't know they had a dog. That's the collector's dog. And then obviously that comes into play later when he sicks the dog on the police officer who shows up and, you know, rips his throat out. So I like that little twist to it. The segment of Arkin sneaking around and trying to avoid the collect the collector initially when he gets in the house and realizes there's someone else there is actually pretty well done from a tension standpoint. You know, all that sneaking around, I feel like it goes on maybe a little bit too long, but it keeps the tension and it's effective for that reason. Especially I like the fact where he's kind of going through and he's discovering some of these traps because he's more... You know, has more of an eye to, to being more aware of his surroundings because of what he's doing. Uh, as particularly, I like when he's kind of walking through that one hallway and then there's lightning and you see like all of these um, kind of trip wires that kind of are making like a spider web almost that he almost walks into. Kind of cool. You can see the Arkin debates what to do um, in this film. Uh, whether this is kind of his problem or not or not so I think the you know the facial acting had worked pretty well for the the guy who played Arkin because you really see the debate going on that he's kind of like uh, do I get the goods and get out of here real quick because this isn't really my problem or do I go with my gut and try and save this family and obviously he sticks around to save the family because otherwise we don't have a movie <laughs> the collector looks pretty creepy um, so that is a huge plus. I already talked about kind of liking that character. Um, and what's it? I wonder what the gloves and mask are made of because they almost look a little bit wet and or like slick. I think it was a good choice. I mean, the way he looks, it's simplistic, but it's scary and creepy at the same time, especially with that like little, you know, kind of like pull of the corner of the mouth. Looks good. What's with the scene with the collector moving the knife from hand to hand? Is that a point, like, when the, the older daughter and her boyfriend are there, and they see him, the collector, and he he's they make a point of showing his hands where he's, like, flipping the knife from hand to hand, like, is there a point to that? That's, that's it seems like a very dumb scene to me, and for me, it kind of takes the tension down a little bit, because it's such a weird thing to focus on. I don't know. Maybe other people don't feel that way. I don't know. I do really like the bear trap scene with the boyfriend, though, how he gets nailed with all those bear traps on the floor. That was a particularly good scene. Probably the best death scene, in my opinion, in the whole film. And honestly, overall, for this being a film that's kind of like focusing on these traps, the traps weren't that good, uh, especially after seeing Saw films, because this came out after some of the Saw films. Um, the traps aren't that good. They're not that impressive. So it, it's a bit lackluster for being a film that's a lot about that and being a torture porn film that was supposed to be a Saw prequel. Just saying. Uh, so how was the daughter flung onto the spike, the spiked wall, by the way? It happened fast and it also just is not feasible. Um, yeah, it happened so quick that I was like, wait, wait a minute, how did that happen? We're in the room with the projector uh, where she gets thrown up against the wall and there are the spikes there. Like, it's a cool death, but I was like, how does she get thrown that far? Because first of all, it was so fast I didn't see it. But second of all, like it doesn't seem like that would actually be able to happen. So it's just kind of a bit ridiculous just because they wanted a cool kill, which I would argue, you know, it was okay. Uh, uh, the portion showing the bodies around the house to lighter music uh, is kind of fine where it's just like showing all the bodies around the house, people who are dying. Uh, but then the whole going, then the camera like goes outside in the rain and then it goes up in the clouds and then there's like a bolt of lightning that hits the ground. What is that about? I, I, I don't get it. I, I guess like maybe it was some sort of artistic choice. I, it's a dumb idea. It was, it was a bad idea because it distracts from what you're trying to keep, which is the tension, which is people feeling bad for these people. It just... It doesn't make sense. Like, it has nothing to do with what you're showing. Nothing. I hated that. Oh, the old mirror trick. At the end where uh, Arkin tricks the collector by using his reflection for him to shoot at so he can get the upper hand on him. 
Um, I, I debate whether or not the collector would have actually fallen for that. I mean, you could argue that it was dark enough that, you know, he didn't notice, but the collector seems very smart and also very um, aware of his surroundings. So I don't really think that he would have fallen for that. Plus, it's kind of a dumb thing. Like, it's a lazy, dumb trick, in my opinion. Uh, there's really too much slow motion in the film. They use slow motion way too much. And I, I kind of view that as probably a situation with Dunstan as a director being kind of new to directing. You don't make the best choices. So, yeah, that's one of them. <laughs> Uh, I do think this is a solid ending with Arkin going in the box and you finding out that the who the collector actually was that he was there as the one of the exterminators. But I don't understand how did he have all this time the collector to set up all these traps in the house and also put all these locks on the door. I don't understand because wasn't this at least the way the film played and you know correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. But the way it played out, it seemed like this was the next day after Arkin was there. And did this exterminator just have, like, unmitigated access to the house to do whatever he wanted and no one questioned what he was doing? Because that's, that's, that's a lot of traps that would have taken a lot of time, and the locks as well, and it would, been, would have made a lot of noise. He wasn't there by himself. I just don't get it. Like, it, it just doesn't make sense. Just a lot of things don't make sense in this. Um, yeah. So overall, uh, yeah, the directing seems very amateur. I already talked about that with the rough cuts and everything. Uh, and the people moving at the camera so often in the beginning. You see a lot of the Saw influence, obviously, also with the directing. Um, the audio ends up being all over the place. It's like up, it's down, it's, it's hard to tell what's going on. The music's blaring, the music's, you know, not blaring. It's, the audio was crazy in this, not in a good way. It's a mess. Uh, and the acting, when it really gets going, the acting is pretty decent. But early on, the acting is rough. Uh, real rough. This film looks very amateur in the beginning. It gets better as it goes on. But man, it looks not so hot in the beginning. Um, there's obviously a play on extreme collecting in the film. Uh, it's an interest in insect collecting that kind of makes a crazy leap to collecting humans but i like that like i said i like the concept of the collector i like that character of the collector and that's why i have seen the collection i guess i should do a review for that and i would be interested in seeing the collector uh, the collected if that even ends up being a movie at this point uh, this takes the idea of you never know who's living in your neighborhood and just moves it to a you never know who you're hiring to work on your house you know, think, I'll just talk about this because I recently did a review for it. Think about a film like The Burbs. The Burbs puts front and center that idea of you never know who's living next door to you. You never know who's living in your neighborhood. Now, this film kind of takes that and changes it a little bit and says, you never really know who you're inviting into your house and hiring and what type of access that gives them if they're a terrible person. So it kind of plays on those those fears of the unknown of people and what people are capable of. So, this film's worth watching once. I don't think I want to watch it again. It's not good enough for that, I don't think. So, out of five stars with half stars in play, I'm giving this a two-star rating. Um, I don't think it should. I should go any harsher, and I don't think it, I need to go any better. I can't give it a two and a half because I don't feel in the middle on it. It's not a terrible, terrible movie, but I don't think it's that good. So, two stars, but let's talk in the comments. Do you really love this film? And that's great. That'd be, that'd be fine. You can tell me why. Do you also not like this film that much? Do you hate this film? Are you in the middle? Let's, let's talk about all that stuff. And also, how do you feel about the Saw films? Overall, I like them. I think overall story, interesting enough. And the traps are inventive enough. And that's one of the things, like I was saying... The traps in The Collector are very blah in comparison to Saw. So anyway, um, do me a quick favor. Hit that subscribe button if you like this video or any of the videos I've ever done. That's your best way to repay me because I don't get paid for this. I'm just doing this for the love of horror, putting it out there, hoping people consume it. And you can let me know you're doing that by subscribing. And I'm very thankful for that. Also hit the notification bell when you do that. And then you know whenever I'm putting up a new review or doing unboxing or live stream or whatever. But regardless, I appreciate you taking the time to check this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.